I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. We want to look today at wisdom and revelation from the Spirit. He is the Spirit of wisdom, the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of revelation, not the last book of the New Testament, but the, the revealing of truth to those who are blinded to it. And if He does not do this, then there is no reception of truth. He must do so. This passage is truly amazing. If you know much about the letters to the Corinthians, you know that they were facing lots of problems and difficulties, and the problems and difficulties were themselves. And that is the reality of the Christian life. Our 930 Bible study that Roger is leading is entitled, The Enemy Within. The flesh, the sinful flesh, even for those of us who are born again, we have this battle against the enemy within that we fight moment by moment. Paul even said in Romans 7, when I want to do right, I find evil near at hand. And it's so near that it's in me. It's in me. It is the reason which Paul explains later in 1 Corinthians 15 that we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed because we are not fit for glory. We may not all die. Some Christian generation will be here when the Lord returns to be caught up. But all of us will be changed whether we're in that generation or not. And that's part of the problem. This passage that we look at is right in the middle of Paul dealing with problems in the church, difficulties in the church. And the solution that he has is not to set up uh, human wisdom and pull that out to them. His response, amazingly, is to talk about spiritual reality to talk about who they are because of the work of God in them, to talk about who they are particularly because of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And what you see Paul teaching them is that there are two categories of people. There are the spirit people who are indwelled uh, by the Holy Spirit, and there are non-spirit people, and they're just working according to the wisdom of this age, human wisdom, the rulers of this, this age, and he, he compares these things. He declares some things in this passage that it's remarkable what he does. I want, to, I want you to see some of the results that he can, because of the reality, some of the things he can call for. Over in 1 Corinthians 6, I want you to listen to this. He says, Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? And he's talking about the situation where they have conflicts among them that's led them even to file lawsuits in secular courts against one another. And he says, for the sake of Christ and your brother, why not just suffer wrong? That's not a human way of thinking, is it? In 1 Corinthians 5, he says, there is sexual immorality going on among you you need to deal with it that's not human thinking let me tell you anything that brings about confrontation I have a tendency to try and avoid keep the peace negotiate compromise this is human wisdom how can Paul say these things to them how can he call them to this such otherworldly misunderstood and you know that when you do these kind of things the world will misunderstand often taking it as weakness or as being bigoted the world will say if a man wants his father's wife who are you to say anything about it but we're someone to say something about it because we're the spirit people we are the spirit people who in who in whom reside the Holy Spirit and there is a standard of holiness there is a right and wrong that is outside of humanity that is imposed on humanity by humanity's creator there's right and wrong that that is right and wrong regardless of how we feel about it and we submit to that 
But I want us to see what Paul, how he presents this to them. He, he begins with the problem of, of division and, and factions and parties who are here. And, and, and apparently they have decided to put their worth or their standing in their favorite teacher or who they're following, Paul or Peter or Apollos or even one party is just citing Christ. Paul asks a question, is Christ divided? It's a major issue. What is the witness of the Corinthian church to the world? What is the witness of the Corinthian church to the world when sexual immorality is permitted and even thought of as a demonstration of how gracious and patient we are? What is the witness to the world when believer goes to court against believer and does not consider brothers and sisters that are in the congregation that there are ways to settle differences without going to secular law courts. What's the witness? You see, that is required to ask that question. And the first thing that has to happen is a person to say, I'm concerned for the glory of God. That's my number one goal, not the defense of my rights or the defense of my position or the defense of what I have done. How in the world can we move from the, this human understanding of things to a spiritual understanding? Well, it's because of the reality of who we are. It's, it's inherent to who we are. It's not a choice or a suggestion. It is the reality, and that's what Paul is saying. So I want us to read verses 6 to 16, 1 Corinthians 2, now that you have some context here. And let us read this knowing that we are the people of God. We believe and preach God's truth because the Holy Spirit has revealed and illuminated God's truth. And we live the way we live because of the reality of what is true. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or the, the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen or ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him, these things... God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God." And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths, truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. Father, I come to You now and pray that You would help us to understand this role of the Holy Spirit, that He is the Spirit of wisdom, and that He imparts to us through the Word, the written Word, and the preaching of the Word, spiritual truths, to those who are spiritual. I pray, Lord, that you would help us see the categories of those who are spiritual and those who are not, and that you would help us to act in, as a result of being in the category of spiritual for those of us who are saved. Lord, help us to put away, to identify and kill in our flesh human wisdom and human ways and to ascend in our behavior, in our actions, in our thoughts to spiritual things, spiritual realities. Oh God, convince us 
by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want us to look at this passage. Uh, you need to understand Paul's, Paul's message. He begins this appeal to spiritual realities by saying, this is not, this is not brought about by human means, by human expertise. And that includes rhetoric and the manner in which arguments are made. He says, that's not what I'm about. Now you have to understand that in this day, when there was a lot of difference between our day, no internet, no novels even. I mean, you know, I think there are people in the room who would probably think of a novel or a cassette tape or something like that as a, as a relic, and, a, and in some ways they are. But these people depended on, on human speech often for entertainment. And so the quality and the ability of a person to uh, turn a phrase and to make an argument was considered uh, highly sophisticated and a form of entertainment. And Paul says, that is not what I'm doing. Look at the verses that precede in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. He tells them, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now here is an instruction that it sets the stage for what Paul is about to tell us in our passage that we're looking at today. Listen, he's not crafting a believable, plausible tenable, palatable reality that he thinks might win the day and he can persuade you. He's saying, this is what's true and it separates those who belong to God and those who do not. And he's saying the gospel separates those who belong to God and those who do not. And so our gospel, our spiritual reality is not a morphing, changing uh, 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 move, uh, you know, dynamic thing that can just conform to people's opinions and cultures. It is transcultural. It is above. It is supracultural. It defines standards for culture. It defines whether or not those in a culture will be saved or damned. It cannot change. It is, the, it is the reality of a God who cannot change. And so Paul is right to call attention to their behavior and their problems and say not, well, let's just uh, hire an, a lawyer for each side and work out and compromise. He starts with saying, listen, there are spiritual realities that define what your attitudes and actions and words and thoughts ought to be. Now, he's well aware that being saved does not mean now we think like God. But he is aware that being saved means I long to think like God. Now, that's very important. If you can't see any value in, in, in resisting conformity to this world and its patterns, and to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, to be actively pursuing, but what does God say? I want to think what God thinks about this thing. I want to pursue God. Then I don't see any way that you can be born again. If you have no interest in those things. Sanctification, the growth, the, the progressive sanctification, is our growth in these things, is our pursuit of these things. But we have to understand the reality. We have to understand the reality. Paul says, I didn't show up impressive by the world standards. I didn't even try to impress you by the world standards. I didn't even think what would be impressive to the Corinthians. He came in fear and trembling. And I want you to know that if we understand who God is and who we are and what our task is in this world, that feeling will dominate everything else. A desire to be accepted. A desire to be thought of as, as right. And so 
Paul then goes into the reality of why it has to be this way. It doesn't matter if you think I'm cool or impressive according to the standards of this culture is what he's saying. And that doesn't matter because of what is, come, is yet to come. All right, now I want you to see some things about this passage. There's a lot of we's here. There's some we's. Who are the we? Believers. believers. In most every case, he's talking about believers, and particularly when he starts out, himself and those who are preaching. But really, throughout this, throughout this you're going to see that the we are those who preach and believe the gospel and the word of God. That's who the we are. We have some words to help us to, to understand this. The mature is one thing that he says. And there have been scholars who have said, well, this is, the, this is Paul kind of getting out of whack and going against his own argument from chapter 1. Over in chapter 1, he's talking about the, the, foolish, the foolishness and the folly of the wisdom of this world. The foolishness and the folly of the, what's considered strong in this world. What's considered wise in this world. So that's, that has nothing eternal. There's nothing there. That's a world system that is perishing, going away. God demonstrates this by choosing what is called foolish by the world and making and demonstrating His wisdom. And see, this is what Paul is doing. He uses the mature right here, and uh, the Greek word behind that is the one that means the end, the, the ones who are complete, the completed ones. He may be uh, using, using their own language because of their factions and because if you read and look at the, the problems with their um, exercise of spiritual gifts and how they ranked them and what they thought about them, he's probably uh, kind of putting that in quotes. Yet among the mature, but he's using it with his understanding. That's those who are believers, who are spiritual. And you see that phrase down there in verse 13, those who are spiritual. Verse 15, the spiritual person versus verse 14, the natural person. And that's almost certainly to whom he's referring when he says among the mature. But he says among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Gordon Fee in his commentary on the first epistle of the Corinthians says that his underlying apologetic right here, his underlying defense, his point in this statement is, but despite what you may think, I do preach wisdom. That is the irony of our situation. The world is screaming at us, you fools, you bigots. You intolerant bigots, you're so foolish. And yet, Romans 1 tells us, proclaiming themselves to be wise, they became fools. Those who exchanged basically the Creator and the glory of the Creator for the creature. Paul is saying, no, no. I'm just telling you that it's your brand, what you call wisdom that I reject and do not come in. But, oh no, there's wisdom. Say, what defines this wisdom? Look in chapter 1, verse 30. Because of Him, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord from Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Yes, I'm preaching wisdom today. Wisdom. And you can, when I say wisdom, you can think of this word, truth. And guess who you can think of when I say truth? Jesus. We've got him on record explaining his relationship to truth, don't we? He didn't say, I can explain the truth better than anybody else to you, did he? He said, I am the truth. And so this is why Paul is saying, I came to preach nothing but Christ and Him crucified. And then his claim can be, this is the height of wisdom. This is the highest wisdom that has ever entered into the heart and soul, the ears of man. Of man. This is wisdom. We do impart wisdom. We impart wisdom. Wisdom. Among the mature, 
And then he qualifies this. He explains it. Not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. Listen, if you want to get ahead in this world, if you want to become powerful and impressive according to the world's standards, you're going to have to abandon the teachings of Jesus. Now, God has his people that he puts in positions. But increasingly, if you hold to biblical standards, you're not you're going to find yourself in conflict with the rulers of this age, aren't you? Not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. Now, look at what's next. Who are doomed to pass away in verse 6. Now, that's good news for us. The wisdom that is biblical, that is true, that is Christ-centered, is the wisdom that not only survives, but it thrives and lives and there's life the wisdom that looks safer right now, that looks vastly more popular, vastly uh, more uh, conducive to success in this world, it's doomed to pass away. Turns out, like verse 5 references, this is indeed a faith issue. Is your faith in the wisdom of men or is it in the power of God? That's what it always comes down to. It doesn't matter what the problem is in Corinth, factions, sexual immorality, conflict among believers, going to the secular law courts, trying to figure out marriage issues and all that stuff, spiritual gifts, all these problems. But it always comes down to this, dear friends, is your faith in the wisdom of men or in the power of God? And we have to know my default setting, my flesh, loves the wisdom of men. It loves the wisdom of men. But my spirit, my soul redeemed, trusts in the power of God. That's Romans 7. This is the battle. This is what we're dealing with. How do we, how do we act? Paul says, we impart wisdom among the mature. And then he describes it this way. Verse 7, we impart secret and hidden wisdom of God. Now that's very interesting. This is explained this way in the phrase, the last part of verse 7, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Now this is a secret and hidden wisdom of God. That is, it is, it's not that He has obscured it because the Bible everywhere tells us that Scripture points to it and declares it. Scripture points to it and declares it. Just turn back a couple of pages to the end of Romans in the doxology. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret or kept in secret, um, not revealed for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. Now see, if one thinks... God had knowledge that He kept hidden. Nobody, he didn't talk to anybody about it. But now it's been revealed. We would think that the, the simple solution is, well, all the people can see it now, and now they'll believe God and trust God, and everything will be great. But the secrecy is not that it has been inaccessible, because the way that it has been disclosed is through the prophetic writings. In other words, Paul did... His custom was, as described in Acts 17, 1 to 3, to go to the synagogue and reason from the scriptures. Now, what scriptures would he have been reasoning from? Scriptures that were contemporary to him? No. He was talking about writings that had been read for hundreds of years when he showed up in those synagogues. That's not inaccessible. So this is, but this is a revelation, this is a clarification, an announcement, a preaching, an imparting of wisdom, explaining and showing and reasoning. Here's what's true. And the Spirit is the one who reveals that truth. The Spirit, it was what moves it from the category of mystery and secret and hidden to the reality that dominates my life. It is the Holy Spirit who does that. We impart now I want you to see something. Why is it that we're so concerned with and devoted to expository preaching here? 
Look in verse 13. We impart this in words. We impart this in words. Back in chapter 2, verse 1. Look at the, listen to these words. I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, but I was with you in weakness and fear and my trembling. My speech, my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Listen, he came preaching. And he came preaching in a particular way with a particular message. Not showing up to make them happy. Not showing up to become a popular speaker. Showing up, though, so that they would put their faith not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We impart this in words. Now, what is this? What is it? Look at verse 12b. That we might understand the things freely given us by God. The things freely given us by God. And we impart this in verse 13 in words. Not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, if you follow that, you see the goal here is that we understand the th things freely given us by God. What are the things freely given us by God? Look over in verse 21 of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 21. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. This is what's at stake here. Everything. God has delighted to redeem a people for himself and to, to let them experience and participate and enjoy through Christ his rule and reign over everything that's either material or immaterial. The world or even life and death itself. That are, that, those are the things freely given us by God. Everything. It says it twice, right? All things, all are yours in Christ. Back up a little bit. Look at verse 10. These things God has revealed us through the Spirit. These things. What are these things? Well, he's just quoted Isaiah 64, 4. If you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 64, 4 and read it, you'll find that the emphasis there is not on what many... Uh, evangelical Christians have really run to when they read these words. It's not necessary to read these words, but, but, but I've thought of it this way. Now Paul's quotation of it here says this, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. Listen, it is clear to me in the context that, especially when you read from Isaiah 64, 4, and as a matter of fact, that's probably a good idea. I want you to see this. Turn over to Isaiah 64, 4 if you haven't yet. And I want you to see the emphasis as we read Isaiah. Isaiah 64, 4 says, From of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for Him. Now Paul's quotation of it, his citation of it emphasizes that it's done, what God has prepared, God has accomplished. And here in, in Isaiah, it's God who acts, who in present tense acts for those who wait for Him. We have tended to think, I have, and many others I believe, have tempted, been tempted to think this is just a reference to heaven. Our new Jerusalem, streets of gold, gates of pearl. It includes that, but it's everything that God has done. And we see that phrase uh, in verse, at the end of verse 12, the things freely given us by God. These things, verse 10 says, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. What we're talking about here is God and His history of redemption, the gospel, 
and what that means, past, present, and future. That is what has been revealed to us. And do you know where we go to see the details of what God has revealed to us? Right here. Not only do we have the opportunity to look at the scripture that Paul went into synagogues and reasoned from, but we also have the new apostolic witness to who Jesus is, the explanation. We have four books that give us the account of his life and ministry and who he is and what he said. And then we have the epistles that explain life in view of who Jesus is and what he did and said. We have this. But that's part of the picture. Verse, verse 12 is the key to this entire passage. This is the verse. If this is true of you, then all of the rest of this is true. If what's said in verse 12 is true of you, then all things are yours. If it's not true of you, one thing is yours, and that's wrath. It's wrath because that's what you and everyone deserve. Here's what verse 12 says. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. See, the understanding of these things is important, but the step prior to that is the, the person of the spirit himself. When you take out that phrase and just say, what is the subject, what is the verb, what is the object, you get this in verse 12. We have received the Spirit. We have received the Spirit. Another way to, to describe this, this phenomenon is born again. This is why Nicodemus, who Jesus called the teacher of Israel, and who if you gave a quiz on the law of the prophets and the writings, I would imagine he would do great. And it's why if you looked at his life, you would see that he was very zealous to keep the law of Moses. And yet Jesus says to him, if you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You won't even recognize it. You can't even discern it. It's how crucial this is. Paul is talking to believers, believers who are struggling Believers who have difficulties, the believers who have problems, believers who need to make progress, but they can make progress because of the reality of what salvation is. And it's this, we have received the Spirit. That's the crucial factor. That's the crucial factor. So it is crucial that we both have the testimony of God's Word and we also have received the Spirit who imparts spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Our obedience or disobedience, see, is related to whether or not we have received the Spirit. Is it possible to have received the Spirit and live as if you have not? Of course it is. That's what this letter is full of. Look in verse 3. Look at the, uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 1 and 2. But I, brothers, could not address you. Now look, he called them brothers. Okay? He's saying, I believe I'm speaking to people who believe the gospel and have trusted Jesus and are born again. I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready. Verse 3, for you are still the flesh. How does he see this? While there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Is it possible for Christians to act like they're not Christians? Of course it is. That's what most of the New Testament addresses. That's, that's pretty much the address of the New Testament to believers. Now you need to live up to who you are. You need to live up to who you are. Who are you? You are people of the Spirit. Who are we? We have received the Spirit of God. In chapter 3, Paul says in verse 16, Do you not know that you, and this is a plural in Greek, you are God's temple? And that God's Spirit dwells in you, plural. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. 
Now, is that not reassuring to you? That ought to be reassuring to you right now. It doesn't say that he will never in this life allow God's temple to be attacked and the temple being you. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. You, plural. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells in you. We ought to live a certain way then, right? We ought to live a certain way. This building in and of itself is in no way a temple. There are some ways you could define it as a temple, but the New Testament doesn't even dis define the meeting place building of a group of Christians as the temple. It talks about the people as a temple, and yet we all have a sense of there's things that are probably not appropriate that we do and say and hear. We know that. This is a place that's been set aside for a holy purpose, for the meeting of God's people for worship. Way beyond that, though, way beyond that, is we are the temple. How do we act? How do we think? How do we relate? Should we value one another? Of course we should. Of course we This is... This is what it means to be believers. We have received. So now look, now we've got a couple of we's. We have, we impart. We impart in verse 7. We impart in verse 13. So we are imparting. Uh, verse, verse 6 we impart. Verse 7 we impart. Verse 13 we impart. And we impart this in words in verse 13. We have a message to be proclaimed and we know that it's the mature who will receive this secret and hidden wisdom of God, who is Christ and the gospel, the message of Christ. But we impart because we have received the Spirit. The Spirit is the crucial factor in this. There's no imparting supernaturally unless there has first been the receiving of the Spirit who is from God. This is not the Spirit of the world. This is why most of the books that were given to me back six years ago when I started talking about moving to St. George, Utah for church planting, most of the books given to me, most of the references given to me are of virtually no value. They were full of wisdom. Wisdom that might help someone start maybe a restaurant or a men's clothing store. That's not what we're doing, is it? Praise God. If there is an assembly of the followers of Jesus, that is, a local church, the only factor that, that is absolutely crucial is, have we received the Spirit? That, if the Spirit is not present, there is no church, biblically speaking. If the Spirit is not present, there is no Christianity. This is crucial. And Paul is not commending the Corinthians for their behavior, is he? He's trying to instruct them to get them to understand, look, you ought not to be doing these things because of who you are. We look in verse 12b. If 12a, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. And we've got a purpose clause here. That, or so that. So why is it that we've received the Spirit who is from God? That we might understand the things freely given us by God. You see, because the means of grace... We know that all salvation is by grace alone. It's by grace alone. But what would we say is the instrument of that grace? By what means do we have access to that grace? It's faith, right? And it's not blind faith. It's informed faith. It's faith that commits to a message, a message about a real person, Jesus, and about what he did in space-time history. And all the implications and all of the consequences and all the results of who he is and what he's done. 
We need to know that. We need to know that. We need to become, we need to move toward becoming experts in who Jesus is and what he's done. We need to be becoming experts in who God is and what this whole creation is all about and where it's headed. Why? Because that will help us to see what our role is here and why we ought to act a certain way. If this life is all there is, then we probably ought to put some stake in that and see what we can get out of this. But this life is not all there is. Paul says in the same letter in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life only we have in Christ, we're of all people most to be pitied. In other words, this is just a big joke. And I'm out, is what Paul is saying. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to live a life of suffering and, and, and being ridiculed when there, there's nothing at stake. The only thing at stake is how am I doing in this life? That's not true. There's eternity to consider. Starting from this moment right now. Do I approach eternity to get my view, my preferences, my convenience, my comfort? Or do I approach eternity saying, not my will, but yours be done? To the glory of God alone. That's the question. Now, which is going to be better for me? See, the flesh and the enemy would say, Man, you need to get what you can right now while you can. Get what you can while you can. Who knows? That's what the flesh and the enemy say. But the Holy Spirit. See, I've received the Spirit. And I can't be satisfied with that. And he says, There's so much more. How much more is there? Do you see this in verse 21? All things are yours. That's the comparison. Human wisdom, limited, ignorant, wrong. All things are yours. What has God done to make such a statement, such a declaration? He has created humanity. He's created, period, and allowed rebellion against himself. And he has conquered that rebellion, not just with power and righteousness and justice, but, but with grace and mercy and love, taking on himself in Christ, human flesh, enduring death, even death on a cross, that he might defeat death, exhaust it, and say to his people, there's none left for you, no wrath for you. I can't even define, my mind doesn't comprehend well enough to commend to you what it means that all things are yours. I'm just seeing the world or life or death or the present or the future. Have you ever thought of the future as yours? Either the future is yours as a child of God or the Bible's wrong. The Bible's not wrong. The future is yours. Don't trade that. To stand ground that is losing ground. Human comfort, convenience. To be thought of well by who? Those who are doomed to pass away? That's not worth it. That's not worth it. Listen. Look what it says here. The spiritual judge person in verse 15 judges all things. Now, there's several references that we need to keep in mind there. We're, we're told in verse 6, we will judge angels. There's an eschatological idea here in the future. We have the Spirit. We are able to discern. We are people who follow the truth with a capital T, Jesus, but is himself to be judged by no one. Look at that. It doesn't matter. Some atheist court could drag us in and say, we deem you unworthy of life and execute us. What does that do for us ultimately? It does absolutely nothing because God is our judge and God has declared us righteous in Christ and that death would be nothing but a doorway into experiencing more fully than we can ever experience it in this life that all things are ours. 
All things are ours in eternity, the, the present and the future, life and death, the world. What a lie that Satan tells us. No, don't follow Christ. You've got to hold on. There's so much out there for you in the world. And God says, I'm giving you the world because nobody has it to give but me. That's what he's doing. Verse 16. Who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Of course, the answer is no one. But look what we have. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Now, this is very important for understanding the Trinity. We have received the Spirit, and therefore we have the mind of Christ. How is it that Jesus can say, I'm going away, and lo, I'm with you always? He said both those things, right? He said them to the same people. I'm going away, and I'm with you always. How is that possible? It's possible because His presence is, is mediated to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Because the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Because to receive the Spirit is to have the mind of Christ. You cannot ever get any closer to Jesus than through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and His presence in your life. That's even better than walking around behind Him for three years in Israel. Amen. Jesus said that, right? It's better, it's to your advantage that I go away because I'm going to send you the Helper. So, what do we do here? Look, think about what God has done. Think about what God has done. What has He done? In verse 10, God has revealed what he has prepared or the actions that he's taking all the things freely given to us he has revealed it it's it's even revealed to the point that we have multiple copies explaining it of the bible he has revealed it through the spirit and we understand not everything but we're growing in our understanding because we have the written word of god and we have the spirit who's the author of the word of god illuminating the truth of the word of god to the people of god and so if you're a believer, when you think about these incredible cosmic ideas, like it's even more than cosmic, all things are yours, then that resonates. My God has said to me, all things are yours. Incredible. What else? It's, he's revealed to it through the Spirit. Well, what does the Spirit do? Look at what the Spirit is said to do here. The Spirit searches everything. Say everything? Yeah. How does... How does Paul bring this home to it? The next phrase says, even the depths of God. You want to trade that for some kind of worldly philosophy? That's truly foolish. What does the Spirit do? He comprehends the thoughts of God. Because the relationship of the Spirit to God is, He is God. And He is in perfect harmony and unity with the Father and with the Son. And there is no thought that the Father has that the Spirit is not in perfect awareness and harmony with. And the same for the Son. He comprehends the thoughts of God. And we've received the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? He teaches. He teaches the Gospel. Listen to what Romans 8.16 says. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He teaches us who we are. The Spirit interprets spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. This is like in Nehemiah 8.8, 8, what the, what the uh, Levites did, what Ezra did. Read the law, gave the sense of it, and helped them to understand it. That's what's happening. Do you realize that when we meet together, that's what God has planned? To supernaturally instruct you, encourage you, admonish you, exhort you and me by the supernatural, miraculous reality that we have His Word. It is inscripturated. It is objectively recorded for us and we have it. And the Spirit applies and teaches. The Spirit interprets spiritual truths. You don't even have to depend on my limited knowledge and, and, and vast ignorance. That's not what's at stake. If I'm clear 
the preaching of God's Word, if a preacher preaches what God's Word says, then the Holy Spirit will minister by interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, what's the application? What's the application? In verses 18 to 23 of cha chapter 3, look at all this again. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and your Christ and Christ is God's. Do not trust in the flesh. Do not trust in, in, your, uh, in your circumstances, in this world, in the things that are temporary, in the things that are passing away. Be relentless to say, no matter how you feel about it, I want to know what God's Word says. I want to know how I'm instructed. I would tell you, the, another place that Paul mentions having the mind of Christ, he does so in an exhortation, Philippians 2.5. He says, have this mind in you. But what had he just said? What had he just said? This is an example of, of application. What had he just said when he said, have this mind? among yourselves. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now in the world, that's the way to stay at the bottom. But in the temple, but in the you, the plural you, in whom the Spirit dwells, this is the way to experience all is yours. This is the way. This is the way. Let us forsake the wisdom of this world and partake of the glorious blessings of belonging to God through the gospel and by the power of the Spirit. If you're here today and you say, I don't know, how do, how do, I, how do I do that? Look, Jesus is the only hope you have. His person and work. We want to explain that more to you. But His death, burial, and resurrection is the way that sinners can be re uh, reconciled to God. His perfect righteousness can count for you if you trust in Christ and Him alone. And we can live by the power of the Spirit in a Christ-like way that sets us apart and brings glory and honor to God. And the end result is, all is yours, your Christ's, and Christ is God's. Soli Deo Gloria. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the truth of your word, for the amazing reality of the work of the Holy Spirit in searching, comprehending, teaching, interpreting, so that we might know the things freely given us by you, God. Draw us all to yourself, I pray, for your glory. Help us to be relentless in the pursuit of who we are and living that out. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.